Gentlemen, welcome to the Be The Man podcast. I'm your host, Greg Denning. I'm the creator and coach of the Be The Man Masterclass and Tribe. And honestly, fellas, if you're not in there yet, you need to be in there. Man, it's a community of amazing men. Couldn't think of a better group of guys I want to be spending time with and growing together with my brothers. It's, they're awesome. So, gentlemen, do you ever do you ever get in that state? Maybe when you watch a movie or listen to a song or, or read a book hear a story, maybe meet with, with somebody. It, t- it tends to happen maybe around uh, little children, babies, and people who are, are at the end of their lives, where you, you, it kind of gets you just nostalgic and in deep thought and gets you thinking about the, the meaning of life and what's really important in life. And you, you know what I'm talking about? You get into that state and it's just, so you go along and, and normally you're thinking about got to do this, got to do this, and your to-do list. And then you just stop and think, oh man, life. What what is it? What does it really mean? And and you get in that kind of calm, deep state thoughtfulness. I I love experiencing that, and I've been experiencing it more and more recently. And I started I started listening to the life of Samuel Johnson by Boswell, which is a gigantic uh, book series of books, uh, but just a great thinker and philosopher and lived an incredible life. And also started listening to uh, a book called uh, what's it called? The Greek. Zorba, Zorba the Greek. And, you know, it's, it's a setting in the 1800s and, you know, these merchants and he runs into this, this rough old man and, and he decides like, oh well, yeah, come work for me. And he's on a ship and he goes and works. Turns out the old man like becomes like a, a mentor and a teacher. He's a philosopher. He's always kind of philosophizing about the meaning of, of life and the meaning of things and how to interact with life and how to interact with people. And, so he's just really thoughtful. You're just you're going along, and there's a there's a fictional narrative just kind of cruising along, and then he'll just stop and share something, and you're just like, "Wow, man, so insightful about human character and the nature of life and and what things mean." And and sometimes they're not really significant things, nothing earth shattering, but you just listen. And you're like, "Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That that is it's insightful. Why people do what they do, and and how to engage with life, and and how not to engage with life, and where people make mistakes." And so as I've been thinking about these things and thinking about the the kind of uh, and I do this a lot right I've always I've always been there very thoughtful about the kind of man I want to be I, I think mostly because uh, you know my, my 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 parents divorced early on stepdads came and went and and I saw I couldn't have articulated this when I was a kid but I kept seeing examples of what not to do and and so I, just, I as a kid I kept thinking I remember this like thinking like I don't I don't want to be like that but that was about the extent of it. I was like, I just don't want to be like that. And then as I got into my teens and experienced more of it, I was like, man, I don't want to be like that. And so it was a whole lot of like, uh, I was really clear about what I didn't want to do and who I did not want to be. And then I started getting clarity about, okay, well, what kind of man do I want to be? And how, how do I want to live my life? What works? Like, What works for people? What doesn't work? And really, really what broke free everything for me was when I realized I'm like, it's all a choice. It's all a choice. There was a time where I really believed it was it was your circumstances, it was your situations. Like, well, yeah, you're you know you're born that way, or that was that's uh, well that man that sucks. You're just really unlucky. That just happened to you. Of course, you acted like that. But then I realized, like, no, man, we always have a choice. I think I think that really came from uh, reading like Man's Search for Meaning. He said, even the the last of all freedoms that can never be taken from you is your ability to choose your state of mind your attitude of mind, right? They, they can never, nobody can ever take that from you. It's like, what? This is huge. I get to choose my emotions. I get to choose my reactions. I don't have to react a certain way when people do things. That that was just pivotal for me. It changed the whole way I approached life. And so as I became more and more adamant about thinking about the kind of man I want to be, and now, now fellas, I don't know if you guys do this, but I think about you know, how I want to be in the future. I hope you see yourself. I hope you see yourself as your best self a year from now, five years from now. And I hope he is vastly better than you are right now. I know for me, it's like, I, I have no business at all being the same person next year that I am this year. I ought to be green and growing and keep getting better and better and wiser and wiser. And that I want to be, I can see myself in old age with the, kids and grandkids and great grandkids and people around you know i got the the white beard the iconic white beard 
And I want to live the caliber and quality of life, gentlemen, that is such that it's it's worthy of being written down, that my life story is worthy of being told and retold, and that I have earned the experience of people coming and asking for advice or counsel or wisdom, right? And it's this this isn't arrogant and it's not to assuage or, or you know appeal to to my ego, which we're going to be talking about. Or, you know, some kind of vanity of like, oh, I want to be important or I want to be significant. I want to live a life that earns those things. And 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 again, that's it comes from from meeting people who are doing incredible things and from reading great books of individuals who who live that kind of life. And you're like, well, no wonder they're writing books about this person. No wonder they're making movies and singing songs and writing poems. Like, no wonder. Like they're doing spectacular things. They're living genuinely great lives. I want to live that kind of life because that's the best way to live, honestly. And then it's it's worthy of the influence you earn uh, later on down the road. Anyways, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. But what's come up again and again and again in, in my journey is how how much the ego gets in the way. Now, there's been a lot uh, written about the ego and there's lots of different de- definitions around the ego and philosophers have talked about it. One definition is like, it's just, it's your identity. It, it is it is self, I, you know, noticing that you are a being. But for for the context of today, we're going to refer to the ego as the, the negative, uh, prideful, arrogant, selfish side, that, that definition of ego. And how the ego gets in the way. And it was interesting. It came up so often in, in it comes up everywhere. You'd see it in families. And I'd see it I'd be working close with families or I like got to live with other families when I was younger. Got to work with families all over the world. Got to work in humanitarian organizations where you think, okay, surely here, surely here of all places where we're all coming together to try to do some good, surely people will leave their egos out of it. Well, they didn't. And then you go to church, you know, like, okay, of all places in church, like people aren't going to bring their ego. Well, they did. And I, I saw again and again and again how the ego would just wreck things. It would wreck businesses. It would destroy marriages, relationships with kids. It would undo any good that was trying to be done, in, even in philanthropy or in church or religion. I mean, this is a mess. And you see it all over the organizations and communities and politics and sports. And man, it just comes in like a wrecking ball and, and destroys what could be so great. And so a lot of years ago, I've been writing about this for a long time. Uh, I, and I love writing. It's just kind of a, a habit I have. And what's interesting about this, I used to hate writing. I, writing was such a chore. And now I write every single day. I have somewhere around 3,500 pages of, of personal notes that I've written now, uh, just, just taking notes and thinking. And years ago, I started a file and I called it, um, your ego is not invited. And it, and it came from this experience of like, wait a minute, you, you were invited here, but your ego wasn't. So if you're going to keep it around at all, check it at the door when you come in. You know, you were invited into the marriage. You were invited to the family. You were invited to the meeting. You were invited into this organization. You were invited to this business, whatever it is. Or, or you started the business, whatever, it doesn't matter. But your ego wasn't invited. And, and that's challenging, right? Because I, I still struggle when the ego pops up. It's just, it's just there, right? It's just always trying to stick its nose and getting in other things. And it tries to get you to be worried and concerned about things that really don't matter. It, it tries to get in and make sure you get credit for something that, oh, that you're special and that other people know you're special, right? And all this, it just gets in the way. And it's something, I, I don't know if it ever permanently goes away or if it's always just kind of part of the life experience, just trying to get in the way, whether it manifests in so many different ways. But it just wasn't invited. And so I just want to share some things that I've been reading um, and some thoughts I've had. Like, you know, it, it just warps our perspective. And I want to bring in the al- allegory of Plato's cave. If you guys haven't read that, um, please do. It's it's fascinating. And there's so many lessons from it. Um, I think one of the lessons from it, and there are many, uh, applies to what we're going to talk about today and, and the, the illusions that the ego creates. But I want to start, let me start with a quote 
from a, a Tibetan um, Buddhist teacher, and I, I have zero idea how to pronounce his name. Um, it's Chagyam Trungpa, if that's how you pronounce it. C H O G Y A M T R U N G P A. And he, he talks about how there's this, this inner intelligence, this original intelligence, as it were, that, that just lights up our being of who we are, right? And he says that as powerful that is, it just becomes kind of static, um, is his word, static, and, and I, I might say like stagnant or, or confined because the ego stands out so much. And then he says this, that is to say, one purely reacts to one's projections, like what you're projecting, what you're seeing and creating, your projection of, a, of an idea instead of the actual thing itself. One reacts to one's projections rather than just seeing what is. And so instead of just looking at something and seeing it for what it is, we project things onto it. And man, that, it's sometimes it feels like it's impossible not to project things because we're just going through life and having our experiences. We're all operating with some kind of lens that we have, right? We all have these lens of personal experience, whatever. It almost seems impossible not to project something on it, but the, the goal is that the practice, and it does take practice, is to try to see it as it is, not worse than it is, not better than it is, and not some interpretation of it just to see it as it is and then he says so the structure of ego is gradually becoming heavier and heavier stronger and stronger and it also becomes more sophisticated and then he says the primordial intelligence is operating all the time but it is being employed by the ego so the ego ego comes in steps in with greater and greater strength and it becomes heavier and heavier, and it become, becomes this dominant force in our lives for how we see things, how we do things, what we say. And that, that fits so well with the allegory of uh, Plato's cave, where if, and even, you know, if you're not familiar with it, I'll, I'll describe it. If you are, it's, it's just always good to review this thing. I, I like to review it at least every year, just re, retouch on it because it's such a great reminder. It's so thoughtful. Uh, this allegory is that these people are sitting in a cave and there's a light. Uh, in the back of the cave. So the people the people are sitting facing the front of the cave and there's a light in the back of the cave and the light is shining on some objects. And so the objects are there and it can be it can be whatever, right? It can be anything, a chicken or a person or a building or whatever, any any object. And the, so the light is shining on the object and the object is casting a shadow on the wall and the people are sitting. So the light and the object are behind the people and they're sitting there looking at the shadows. And so they see the shadows and they think that's that's what it is. That is the thing, right? But because we're looking in at the cave, we see like, oh, that's not the actual thing. That's just a shadow of the thing. It's just a projection of the thing. And then there's even more to the whole allegory. We're like, well, oh, that's not even real. You can actually leave the cave and go up into the sunlight and see real actual things up there. But man, nobody wants to go because it's so bright, right? There's it's so much light and, and so much exposure. And then you have to question your whole reality and everything you thought was real. Oh, and it's that just undoes everything, right? And there, there's a lot to it. There's so much depth and meaning there and, and so much we can learn from it. And again, I, I believe there are layers and layers of meaning in it. And so... But, but but in this context, I want to say like the ego will project things. And so that becomes your reality. And you're you're seeing things that are just your reality. They aren't, it's it's in contrast to the reality, right? Here's the reality and here's your reality. And your reality often is just projections of things, the shadows of things. And it's interesting how the, the ego will make us see things that aren't really there. Whether it's, you know, somebody's giving you feedback. Are they trying to help you or trying to hurt you? Well, the ego is almost always going to see that as some kind of threat. Like someone's attacking you when really like, they could be sincerely trying to help you. Or maybe not. Maybe because of their ego, they are trying to hurt you. They're trying to keep you down or whatever. I don't, who knows, right? And But you have to see this and you have to try and again this is a journey of trying to 
dismiss the ego and and leave it out of place so we we stop worrying about who's right and we start worrying about what's right and we stop fretting about whether or not you're going to get credit for something and just seek for goodness and even what you seek and what you desire is it is it ego driven or just from just pure goodness, you just want to live a great life and do great things? Or are you so driven that you you want credit for everything? I'm thinking there's a really great short story um, called The Mansion by Henry Van Dyke. We read that every year with our kids for Christmas. It's amazing. And he wanted to do good, but he, he would only do good if he made sure that he got some kind of credit for it. He, he had to let people know that he was doing good. And, and there's a lesson there, right? It's like the ego kind of sneaking in. So, so the ego creates illusions. It creates projections. It, it sees things that aren't there or that aren't real. And, and so I just wanted to kind of walk through that and, and, and talk through that. There's an, there's an excellent book um, called Ego is, is the Enemy by uh, Ryan Holiday. Um, I, I don't remember any of the details of the book. I read it quite a while ago. But man, it's fantastic. I just remember feeling very humble. And very insignificant when you read that. You're like, yeah, like honestly, I am nobody. And 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 that's that's true, right? In in essence, like you're just you're just dirt, man. You're just clay and mostly water, about 60% water, and then some cells and some other stuff, and, and you're fragile. You're just as fragile as the next guy, and you could your life could be over in any moment. And even if you're doing great stuff, so what? And a hundred years from now, you'll be gone. And most likely people won't remember you. And that isn't that incredible? And it's like you're nothing. But then on the other side, yeah, you're you're spectacular. You're amazing. You're a human being, a, a, a spirit. Like it's just awesome. Right. And I believe a, a child of God. And and so there's so much power there, right? But we can't let the ego get in and disturb and mess things up. So I want to read, I want to read a couple uh couple of paragraphs here from Catherine Thomas, because I think the way she described it all is just, just absolutely fantastic. And I want to kind of fit this into how we can see more clearly, how we can move past seeing the shadows, like in the cave and the illusions and the projections and, and discounting the ego, just, just setting it aside. And what we can do is we can go into anything, especially if we've been tempted to let our ego rise um, in certain situations, it, maybe it's work meetings, you, it always comes out, or maybe it's family, maybe it's in your marriage. We're working with couples right now, and man, the ego is just the driving force in, in all of their interactions. You're like, guys, stop. As long as you let your ego have a place in your marriage, your marriage can't cannot be near what it could be. It won't, and it'll probably end in disaster. And I see that all the time. Your, your ego has no place in your marriage, none, nor with your kids. Like there's no spot in the relationship between you and your child for the ego. And it's really not in the workplace either. People you're working with or working for, or they're working for you or your clients or customers or patients or your neighbors in the community. Like there's no place for that. And and if you've got some kind of deep insecurity that you feel like you have to have some kind of certification or title or or badge or some kind of honor or praise or adulation to make you feel important. Well, the, the problem is inside. That's an inside job. And we need to, we need to work through that and overcome that. So, so that gets out of the way of what's really happening. And so it, it's worth examining why you do anything and everything you do. Is it ego driven? Has the ego been just wrecking your relationships? And and examine this humbly, gentlemen. Just spend some time thinking about it today. Thanks for listening to this, by the way, and considering this. I know this is like, this is heavier stuff, right? And we're, we're kind of wrestling with uncomfortable, difficult stuff. And and most, most people don't. Most people aren't going to sit around listening or thinking about this. And just really sit with it and examine yourself and say, what, what illusions have I created? What am I seeing that's not really there? How is my reality different from actual reality? How might your reality be different from other people's reality? 
because this this can help you understand other people too if you can see that the ego is playing a big role in their lives um then you can see like okay they're sensitive about this but it's it's not real or or you can examine like how your reality might be distorted from somebody else's because of your ego but think through it i mean you, I mean, you stop and i i can I can see clearly the times when my ego is getting in the way. I was like, man, the, my ego has ruined or is ruining this thing. Like, just, just stop. Let it go. Is it some, some kind of partnership, some kind of interaction, whatever it is, wherever it is, like some craving of the ego to be right. Uh, somebody one time said, "If if if you're ever presented with the the situation where you can be right or you can be kind, choose kindness." I think it was Wayne Dyer that said that. And some of you even hearing that, you're like, "No, but I have to be right, or it has to be like somebody's got to say something." <laughs> Not always. Is that the ego talking? Right. So it's interesting. Just examine it, and and I'm not asking you to like you now become a silent little. I don't say anything. I don't do anything. I have no ambition because I don't want my ego to get in the way. So it's not that. You can be uh, humbly confident. You can be ambitious. You can be driven. You can be a force of nature. And it's great force for good. And man, you can clear paths and make things happen and do it without the ego. And when the ego kind of sneaks up and wants to stick its nose in or get a foot in the door, just say, hey, get out of here, man. You weren't invited. And and see past the illusion. So going back to the cave, the allegory of the cave, right? You you see the shadows and you're like, wait a minute, those are just shadows. It's not really like that. I'm just perceiving that. And so the first step is you turn around, and you see like, oh, those are shadows. And so you look at the objects themselves, but those are just representations. Even the objects are just representations of real things and the light's casting that. So then the next step is to move past that to the light and then move past that to leave the cave and to go out into reality. And I mean, there's all kinds, of, again, layers of meaning there. What does it mean to go into the light? Right? Where, where is the light? What What is that enlightenment and exposure? Where Where is truth? Where is understanding? How is it that we see things as they really are? Right? And so that's a very spiritual experience. For some of you, it's drawing closer to God and, and experiencing that truth. Some of it's just getting clear inside and, and getting rid of all the scripts that we have in our heads and the fixed mindsets and just, just getting rid of all that. So it's just pure intelligence operating there. And so I was just feeling, feeling the spirit and energy of, of spirit and of the universe of God and, and all those things. And, and some of it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't even have to be all that spiritual. Some of it could just be like, well, it's just, Let's just read from some of the greatest thinkers and, and leaders and writers of all time and examine their thoughts and, and realize where we've been seeing things that weren't there or, or creating, telling ourselves stories that aren't actually accurate or true, right? So we're just examining all this and trying to get to a place of humility and enlightenment. All right, let me read, let me read these paragraphs from, from Catherine Thomas. Our main concern here is understanding and identifying within ourselves the thought world of the ego. Right? I love how she calls that. It, there's a thought world of the ego where the ego is kind of directing what's going on. Because, she continues, it distorts our mind through a variety of ways. To give an all too familiar, though incomplete profile, the ego is vain and greedy. It's hateful and prideful. It's resentful and envious, angry and fearful and more. It can be grandiose, it can be intolerant, arrogant, and overbearing. It is self-absorbed and thereby insensitive to the needs or feelings of others. That one's interesting, right? Or I pause here for, for my thoughts on that one, right? The ego steps in like with the cave and, and all you can see is what's in it for you and what concerns you and how you're being affected. The ego's like concerned about that. Like, whoa, it's all, no, it's all about me. Like this is me and I'm I'm being wronged here and this is all oh, this. Is all, blah, blah. And we, we become insensitive and self-absorbed, right? But then on the other hand, I'm, I'm not in any way, shape or form saying you should just be a doormat 
and lay down and let people take advantage of you because, well, it's not no concern about myself here. It's all about others. That's not true either. In fact, that that's kind of a sly, subtle way of, of the ego jumping in again there, right? Really interesting. Okay, she continues. It can be brutal and remorseless. When the ego's self-esteem trips, when the ego's self-esteem trips fail to produce what it wants, a person can call, fall prey to apathy, hopelessness, and victimization, all ego states. It must continually have an opinion or be approving or disapproving of events and people and things, right? It's always got to step in there and share what it's seeing. Creating a narrow mental world. Again, like the cave. This is so fitting with his cave. The ego mind is contracted. And we know how it acts when it finds itself frustrated over this or that. And when it doesn't get what it wants. The ego is always trying to run the show. Man, good insights there. Continuing, she writes, While one labors in the inner chaos of the ego... He remains in a sort of spiritual unconsciousness or spiritual sleep so as not to see the truth about what he is doing. So an untrained person may try to keep the mind occupied with entertainment and mental chatter, projects, works, schemes for accomplishment or for pleasure, with novels and magazines and television and websites, with eating and going to parties or with drugs and so on. Anything to avoid examining the superficial and unsatisfactory quality, the self-accusing emptiness of his life. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop in, in her reading right there to kind of just comment on that. This is what I'm talking about earlier when I was like, well, let's, we got to stop and examine all this. We've got to look at all of it. Look it straight in the face and see it as it really is. Look past the shadows. Look past the, the objects that are projecting the shadows and get to the real thing. But there's there's some discomfort in that and some pain and, and process in it. And, and it's a journey and it's it's mental work. It's inside work, right? It's the inside job. It's, it's working on the inner man. And we have to examine all the things we're doing in ways we might be numbing or buffering or avoiding. And when we start examining it closely, like she says here, you see the superficial and unsatisfactory quality, the self-accusing emptiness of his life. Ho, 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 right? And that, my friends, is painful to the ego. And it, it, well, it stings. It stings a little bit as a man, too, because you're like, look, I'm not, I'm better than that. And, and that's not an ego statement to be like, no, as, as my absolute best self, I'm better than that. I'm above the ego. And I'm not going to sit around wasting my life. I'm going to, you know, just get this one great shot at life. I'm going to do amazing things with it. So she continues. And then we could add the expense, energy, and anxiety dedicated to cosmetics and clothes and all in a desperate search for esteem and approval. Of course, there is nothing wrong with most of these activities just mentioned in and of themselves. And she continues, rather, it's the way we use these activities as a form of avoidance to keep us from discovering the roots of our dissatisfaction and sorrows. These can help us to remain spiritually unconscious and asleep. And as soon as we come to see our own attachment to just staying asleep. Wah! Interesting. One last thought here from her. She says, a common, perhaps universal ego prompting is to look for self-fulfillment, quote, out there, close quote, outside oneself, for example, through seeking acceptance or praise from others and gaining power over others. All right. So, I mean, those are just some great examples and thoughts there of, of what's going on if the ego's driving. So I, I just want to throw this out there. I've been thinking about this, thinking about the the, cal the caliber and, and quality of man I want to become and the kind of life I want to live and how I want to be uh, remembered. Not, not in an egotistical way of like, oh, I want to be important. I want to be remembered and thought of well, but as my absolute best self, you know, having an impact for good, being a great force. That's my driving mission is to be a great force for good in the world. That's it. That's what drives me. That's what motivates me. And I want to do that, but if my ego gets in the way, then I lose uh, the power I could have to do good. 
And so that's what I think I want to be people to remember because they will remember the interactions. And I want it to be from a, a good place. So will you with me just make some time and effort to examine all the interactions, what you do, when you do it, why you do it, and, and go ahead and examine all of it, like what you wear and why and, and what you drive and where you live and, and all those things. Again, there isn't anything inherently wrong with all that, but it's worth examining your motives. Why are you doing it? And to see past the shadows, and this takes some serious honesty and, and even practice of honesty because it's not – the ego is going to want to be like, oh, no, 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 and it's going to like play this game of tricks and mirrors and shadows and smoke and, rah, rah, and all this stuff. And and again, just like the cave, right? Oh, no, no, this is it. This is it. Oh, okay, okay. And it's going to it's gonna try to pull that up. So it, it, it's going to take some close examination and some humility just to look at it. Because I promise, fellas, this is one thing I can I can promise. We will all be better men with less ego. And we can set the ego aside and be willing to be who we need to be and do what we need to do and go where we need to go if the ego is not there. right? Set the ego aside and, and we'll do that stuff. And man the the joy and the fulfillment and the meaning and the excitement and the, and the epic life you can live right the thing i think most often about i think about this all the time as i'm working with men and thinking about men like as men we we want to have it all we want we want to be the man physically mentally emotionally spiritually socially financially like there isn't any one of those like nah it doesn't matter I don't want that. I don't. I don't. I don't care if I suck at that or I'm pathetic at that. <laughs> we do, and and I think this can be from a pure place, and you know, ego out of the picture from this pure place of, of I think a divine desire, to be to reach for potential, to grow, to climb, to prove, to make a difference, to really live while we're alive. And so we want we want all of that. And those are all, those are great things. And I hope you want to be your absolute best self. And the ego, isn't this so, it's so ironic, right? Because the ego wants all this stuff, but for the wrong reasons and in the wrong ways. And, and it, the irony is that the ego can actually prevent us from having all of those things in a way that is fulfilling and meaningful and whole instead of empty. So anyways, thanks. Thanks for listening, fellas. Um, I value your time. I value you as a human being. And it's uh, genuinely, it's, it is uh, an honor that you would listen. And I take that as like a sacred responsibility. And I, and I hope that in, in saying this, that we can, we can all just examine where we're at and where we're going and, and any elements we find there, just like identify it and say, okay, you're out, buddy. <laughs> Mr. Ego, you were not invited. And dismiss it, remove it, check it at the door, and maybe set alarms or alerts or write, write about it each morning, especially if it's been chronic. If there's been one area in particular where it really stands out, so that's just got to stop and be willing to totally transform yourself, become a new man. I keep thinking about that, especially in marriages. We're working with these marriages and, and we're trying to help them and it's just, it's not working and they're, they're in their old patterns and their button heads and they're fighting and the conflict is there. And I was like, man, if you would just completely stop and, and transform yourself into the better version of you, not, you don't have to become this totally different person, but just stop right there and become your best self. Wow. That would, that would change everything, all the dynamics, because now all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I'm, I am now married to a totally better version of you, which forces both of them to like change and re-examine and, and work things out and figure it out. We'll just check the ego. Things will get so much better. So much better. So, um, love it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Subscribe. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do that. Um, share this with friends, family, colleagues that 
it would be. <laughs> and the ego's like, oh, yeah, they need that. <laughs> or afraid. Don't share that. They don't think we're saying something. But like, share, share, share the podcast. Be, be a part of this, this mission and this message. And you know, again, if you guys uh, have any questions, um, if I can help you, serve you in any way in your life and business and, and the, the things you're pursuing, um, I'm happy to do that because this is it's what it's all about. So love you, gentlemen. Thanks for being great men. Thanks for caring. Thanks for listening to this. It says a lot about you to, to listen to this and to consider it and, and examine your life. So let's go out. Let's all be better men. Let's dismiss the ego and live life as our best selves. Be the man. <laughs>